the spiritual gifts that may cause division in the body. Now, could you turn your attention to the book of Corinthians? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I want you to keep your Bibles marked there. We'll be asking Pastor Edison to do a brief exhortation. Then we would be asking Pastor Mackenzie also to do a brief exhortation. Pastor Suzanne and our intern Chanel, they all would be sharing. The order in which they would come would be Edison, Suzanne, Chanel, and Brian. But just to set the frame of reference, while you keep your hands on Corinthians chapter 12, if you can block there and walk with me and capture a couple phrases, that's critical, elsewhere in the biblical text. So you, you turn to Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. It's just a phrase I want us to keep in mind. Acts 20 and verse 28. The latter part of that verse says, Feed the church of God. Have you found it yet? Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 2. How does verse 2 begin? Unto the church of God. But there's a difference there. Unto the church of God at Corinth. The church of God at Ephesus. It's localized. Now, attaching the local designation to church of God, when you look at the Greek construction, you would have Kingdom of God, Church of God. Ecclesia Tufelu or Kingdom Basilia Tufelu. And you look very closely at some of the construction. And just to do the little grammar. The genitive case is used. And the genitive case is the case of possession. So if you own something, you use the genitive case. So the church is not belonging to any man. To any organization, to any pastor, apostle, prophet to do with it as they please. So Ephesians, Paul spoke to the Ephesians, feed the church of God which he purchased. How many of you bought the church? Do you know of any pastor who bought the church? Any apostle or prophet? Whenever you see men functioning as if they own the church, they are not doing Bible church. They're doing something else. So if our churches, be it the local expression or the universal expression, if our churches are to be strong and alive, we must do church the way the owner wants it to be done. Whenever we deviate, we turn into a bureaucratic religious system of policies, bylaws, constitution that is not life-giving. We become social elite clubs that set bar as to who is to join and who is not to join. We establish membership cards and unless you pay your dues, you would not be allowed to enter into the door. I am so glad to report today that the church of God, as Paul put it in Timothy, is the pillar and ground of truth. And it is through the church, God is given expression of his purpose and his will on the earth. Corinthians 12 is a very important passage, a very important chapter, because it speaks to us as to how we should do church. And may I dare say to you, Paul starts the church of God at Corinth. But Corinth was one of the most troublesome churches that ever existed in the New Testament. 
you break into chapter 1, there's schisms and divisions. Anybody there? You break into chapter 2, there is in fact immature carnal believers, partisan spirit, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, but yet he still says, the church of God at Corinth. You break into chapter 5. You have problems with incest. Never be heard, heard before. You break into chapter 6. Brother taking brother to court. Paul said, what happening there? You break into chapter 7. Some male brothers were having sexual relationship with their sisters who were not their wives. So Paul had to correct that. You break into chapter 8. There was confusion about meats offered to idols. You break into chapter 10, there was a problem of idolatry and sensuality and he warned them, you get on all the children of Israel in the wilderness. You break into chapter 12, you find the chapter 11, you find a problem with communion where some brothers who were hungry, they were coming because in, in back then in the communion time it was a big loaf. Eh? Wasn't this little piece of bread that choked you this morning? a big loaf and you would come and break off the loaf so some brother says uh-huh free food in church i will not eat at home so paul had to straighten them out and says if anybody hungry eat home what a wonderful church your church at corinth you break into chapter 12 there's problem about spiritual gifts mass confusion so paul had to say god is not the author of confusion what wrong with you people you break into chapter 15. Some people were saying the resurrection had already occurred. So you had to speak to the old matter of the resurrection. How many of you would want to apply to be members of the church at Corinth? Or you're looking for the perfect church. We'd have no problems. Yet Paul calls it the church of God. Where? At Corinth. But how do we transcend all of these challenges? Today we speak to one of them. And that is. The spiritual gifts that may cause division in the body. So let's put turn our attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we will look at verse four, verses 4 to 6. And we see in verse 4, Paul said that there are different kinds of gifts. But the same spirit that distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. When we think of spiritual gifts, church, I want to make one clear differentiation. When man gives you a gift, it's for you. In fact, people get offended if you give away a gift. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So much so, when people give you a gift, they want, especially if it's clothes, pastor, they want to see you wear it. Huh? It's for you. It's for your consumption. It's for your pleasure. But when God gives you a gift, it's not for you. Are you getting that? When God gives you a gift, it's for the body of Christ. So when you have a personal gift from a friend, you could choose not to use that gift if you want. I have some ties I have never used. I hope I have no give up those ties here. <laughs> but when God gives you a gift, you will be held responsible for not using that gift. Because that gift is not for you. It is for the body of Christ. Do you get that? But Paul goes on to say that giftings are diverse, but it's the same spirit. Diverse streams, but one fountain. But it's quite interesting that our foolish pride gets us all worked up in terms of this whole thing about giftings. Why do we boast about our giftings? You didn't earn it. The gift you have is not because of any special kind of a something you have. But it, the gift you have is strictly because of God's unmerited favor, His grace. God has distributed His, His gifts 
according to his own grace. So we can't boast about what gift we have. We have been given that by God for a purpose. Why do we feel at the same time that some gifts are more important than others? So some people who have the gift of prophecy, and of course we have that being loaded about today, and somehow we feel the gift of prophecy is more important than the gifts of helps. Well, Paul sought to deal with that today. And he said every gift that is given has an equal function in the body of Christ. Let me give you an illustration. Take, for example, the heart. We all know the function of the heart, don't we? Yes? To pump blood throughout the body, we understand the function of the heart. What about your spinal cord? We all know the function of the spinal cord. Yes? The brain sends messages to the body through the spinal cord. We understand that. But how many of us have, have ever heard of the epiglottis? Could I see the hands of those who have heard of the epiglottis? Couple biology students know what I'm talking about? Well, let me tell you what the epiglottis is for those of you who have never heard. You have that track right here in your neck. You have two of those. The first one we call what? The windpipe? It's called a trachea. That, that track takes air to your lungs. And right behind that, you have another track called the esophagus. Come on, biology students. And that one takes food to the stomach. But there is a little flap called the epiglottis between the trachea and the esophagus. And that, that functions to stop food particles from going into your lungs. How many of you can try this exercise right now? I want you to try to swallow and breathe at the same time. Take a second and try that for me. Anybody successful at it? The reason why you cannot swallow and breathe at the same time is because of the epiglottis. It stops what is supposed to go into the stomach from going into the lungs. Could I suggest to you that we live in a time when we all want to be some great pulmonary vein or some pulmonary artery, but God has called some of us to be an epiglottis. Nobody knows your name. Nobody knows you even exist. But I'll tell you something. If you don't function, come on somebody, if you don't function, we're dead. So God has given diverse gifts. And it's about time for us as a church to stop trying to figure out who is of Paul and who is of Silas and who has a greater gift. God has given those gifts as he desired. And he has given every gift as he sees fit to function in his body. And God knows exactly where you need to function. My encouragement to you today, church, is understand your gift, understand your function, and be a blessing to the kingdom of God. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I am an epiglottis. Thank God for those who are not seen, but are still so vital in the kingdom. Amen? So, um, my verse of scripture that I'm looking at is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Of course. And I'm looking I'm looking at verse 18. First Corinthians chapter 12, the same verse, the same chapter, sorry. Just looking at verse 18. I'm reading from the NIV version. It says, But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them just as he wanted them to be. God is the one who has done it. The all-powerful, eternal, mighty, sovereign God. I want to ask a question. Has God ever made a mistake? Has he? He has never made a mistake, right? Okay. So let me read it again. But God has what? Just as he pleased. He has placed members. He has placed the members in his body. Okay? Now, 
there is the body of Christ, which is the universal church. And then as Pastor pointed out, there is a church at FHL. Okay? So within FHL, the Lord God Almighty, the eternal God, has placed gifts in the body, right? And God has never made a mistake, right? So, if the Holy God has given you a gift and you are planted in FHL, it means that there is need for you in FHL. Everybody understands? Yeah. I want to turn to another portion of scripture in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. It says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So just as Pastor Eddie was saying, we, not, we are not supposed to take ourselves to be so important. So if I don't show up, nothing will happen. Hello? That is not so. What God wants us to do is for everybody to come together and cooperate and do and function in the gifting that he has given to each and every one of us. And if you withhold your function, it doesn't mean that church done or church mash up. But have you ever seen someone who has a cut on their foot? Now, I don't want to call any names, but there's somebody who recently had, and you see that person cannot walk as good. She, there, there is something wrong, all right, with the foot. But she's here. She's functioning, but with a limp, perhaps. The Bible knowledge commentary says, the gifts are not haphazardly distributed, but carefully arranged according to the perfect will of God. So God has not just, you know, like how we like to do sometimes a quick something, thing, put things together, and then, no, 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 Not the great mighty God that he is. No, he has not done that. Therefore, all members of Christ's body, all of us have their place determined by God and have an appropriate function or ministry which we should all find and develop. Trust in God for empowerment by the Holy Spirit. We ought to appreciate each other for the diversity, for the difference, not envy anybody's ministry or gift. The purpose of the gift, as Pastor Eddie rightly said, is not for me, to make me feel I'm so great. It's not yours. It was given to you when we became members of the body of Christ. Some people have a talent, good, fine, but a gift is different as we know. So it's to build up the body. And finally, what I was thinking of this morning, have we ever seen a florist, someone try to put together an arrangement, flowers? They don't just take any old flower. First, they choose the particular vase that they will use. And then, they will select the flowers. They will select what we might call the fillers, the baby's breath and everything else. And that individual will put together an arrangement. Before, it was just single flowers, roses, tiger lilies, whatever. But when it comes together, it is a beautiful bouquet. The individual does the choosing. That individual does the placing. Similarly, the Lord God Almighty, he has placed us here 
and he has given to us some one, some two, giftings, special abilities that he wants us to use in his kingdom for his honor and for his glory. My challenge to each and every one of us, find out what your gifting is. Then pray and ask God how you can be useful in FHL. Also, seek to develop that gifting. So if it is, like for me, in, in, for instance, when I realized I had that gift of administration, I went to study. I did management. Okay, because I think management administration could go hand in hand. And when I was doing the courses, everything, even though it was on a secular basis, my mind was always looking at church and how things are organized, etc. So in that way, let's all use, develop the giftings that God has given to us for his honor and for his glory. Thank you. Yes, so I want to take it from this 20 to 26, so I'll read. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. No again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we, we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God has God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. I want to read also the New International Version from verse 23 to 24. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with, with special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. And King James Version with the, strong Bible, the Strong's Bible says, For our commonly parts have no need, but God had tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that which lacked. So I'm going to speak to God tempering the body. God has tempered the body. And one definition of, of tempered is to bring to desired consistency. Another meaning is to cause several parts to combine into an organic structure to unite one thing to another. So God in his wisdom has tempered the body and brought all the parts together as one. And when we read in the scripture earlier on, it, it, it was basically saying that no one, well, no one part or no one member is more important or, or, or one is more is, is insignificant. All are equally important and God combined everything together to create one unit. I want us to look here at the reasons why God did this. There's one reason. So that there should be no schisms in the body, meaning no separation. That the members should have the same care one for another. So that if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And also, if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So God knows what he is doing. It won't have anybody feeling like I am not important. By bringing every part together, each part is honored. Each part is identified as being important. God wants equality in the body. He wants, he wants everyone to be unified. Now, the, the members, FHL is, is one member in the body of Christ. But when we break it down further to just FHL alone, there are different members within FHL. And as some of the ministers mentioned just now, each person will have different gifts and God will place different gifts within FHL. And 
each person's gift is equally important. Not because you are just a person that's cleaning, it means that you are insignificant. Because there's this, this saying that um, I hear a lot, we are only as strong as our weakest link. And so, if one person isn't functioning, then it means that the whole will be affected. So each person's purpose and function is important, and this is why God has tempered the body, so that there will be unity, there will be oneness in the church and in the body of Christ as a whole. So each member in FHL is important, nobody is insignificant, and by us coming together, it will have strength and unity, and we will be able to be a force to be reckoned with. So that's it for me today. Praise the Lord. I want to share with you from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to read from 27. And it reads, Now we are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God had set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that, miracles, the gifts of helping, helps, healing, sorry, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. Now, it's important for us to identify the climate in which the church of Corinth existed. The church at Corinth was started by Paul during his second missionary trip. And that city, the city of Corinth, on the highest point of that city was a pagan temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. There must have been intense opposition to the message of the gospel and the establishment, establishment of a church at Corinth. God had to encourage the apostle Paul in a vision, the Bible says, in Acts 18, 9 through 10. Then speak the Lord to Paul in the night. By your vision, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. There is almost no modern day ch local church problem that is not covered in First Corinthians. The book divides into two sections. First of all, it spans from chapter 1 to 6. It addresses seven corruptions. First off, they perverted the doctrine of baptism. And they favored earthly wisdom, wisdom in chapter 1. In chapter 2, they were floundering with the flesh. In chapter 3, they had forgotten future judgment. In chapter 4, they were flattering themselves. In chapter 5, they failed to discipline unruly church members in chapter 6 there were division among them they were suing each other and taking one another to court the second section of the book starts from chapter 7 and continues until the end chapter 16 Paul in this section responded to a, to letter, to a letter written to him from the church at Corinth and you can find that in chapter 7. Now concerning the things wherefore he wrote unto me, six questions he seeks to answer. In chapter 7, he answers the questions concerning marriages. In chapter 8 and 10, he speaks about, he answers the question about Christian liberty. In chapter 11, he speaks about church conduct. In chapter 12 to 14, the nature and use of spiritual gifts. And in chapter 15, the resurrection. And then finally, he speaks about the financial collection towards the poor. Could you imagine being a pastor of this church? Each subject is introduced from chapter 7 and onwards by the key word now. In the section that we read, the gifts are given, first of all, Paul said, by God himself. None of us has all the gifts. And the gifts are not for sure. 
you know, there seems to be a competitive, competitiveness amongst ministers, among, amongst preachers who has the biggest church, amongst the, those that use the gift of prophecy. The gifts were not for show and they were not to be competed. The gifts were for the benefit of the church or the body of believers. Also, the gifts, they differ. Either you had a gift or you didn't have a gift. The gifts can be abused and they have been abused in two ways. Number one, not using the gifts imparted unto us. Paul had to encourage Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. In 2 Timothy 1 and 6, Paul again writing to Timothy, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Tell your neighbor, stir up the gift. We have already established that in no uncertain terms, there are gifts give unto the church but i want us to remember to stir up that gift that's the word i want to leave with you stir the gift that god has given you the verb in in the greek is is used in this passage in this passage is used to denote the kindling afresh or to keep in full flame it is used metaphorically where the gift of God is regarded as a fire capable of dying out through neglect. So I want to say to us, if God has given you a gift, stir the gift. Amen, somebody. Fan the flame, le least it goes out. This is the idea that he is suggesting to young Timothy. Secondly, the gifts can be abused. In attempting to use those gifts that are not imparted to us. We see that shown clearly in Acts chapter 8 when Simon the sorcerer seek to purchase the gifts. We also saw that with the sons of Sceva in Acts 19 and 14 where they tried to cast out a demon from an individual and they were beaten, the Bible said, and stripped naked because they did not have the gift of deliverance. So church, I want to remind us to stir the gift. Fan the flame. And the gift will be used to benefit the entire body. God bless you richly.